consecutive 17 tonight. All right, but feel free to join. We're about to get started. My name is Charlotte. I'm one of the site interpreters here. I'm going to talk about a couple of things today, a little bit about these cabins and a little bit about the lives of three of the people that were enslaved here. But before I talk on them, I do want to talk on the cabins. These are not the original ones. These six structures are rebuilt in 2013 based on archaeological, um, they did an archaeological dig here, ground penetrating radar, maps, and a single photograph from about 1890. It's that first black and white photograph y'all saw when y'all came in. Starts off the exhibit. Size, dimension, look, feel, these six are about as accurate as possible, but there would have been 20 originally. 10 on this side, 10 on the other side, 20 cabins, but 40 residences, two families per cabin. There might have been two or three people on one side. There might have been six or eight or more on the other side. It just depended on how many people were in that family or household. Now in front of the cabins, none of these trees are going to be back here. These are all babies. They were planted after 1925, so they're only 100 years old. Originally, this is almost completely out in the sun. It's hot, it's humid, the sunlight is necessary. Behind the cabins are fruit and vegetable gardens. The enslaved community had to tend to their own gardens on their own time with whatever limited time they had off, but they had to tend to those gardens because the rations from the big house were never going to be enough on their own. Typically on this property, the rations consisted of corn, dried fish, sometimes pork fat or rice. They're filling, but they're not very sustaining foods. The big house doesn't know what malnutrition is yet. They don't know the difference between a full belly and a happy belly. By combining the two food groups though, the slave community does something amazing. They create the lasting dishes that, well, I say Louisiana, I say food. What are some of the first dishes that come to mind? Red beans and rice. Gumbo. Red beans and rice, gumbo. Fish. Etouffee, fish, jambalaya. Crawfish. Y'all need to eat a little bit more because these should be readily coming. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you that it's cold. Maybe it, it's taken a little while to yeah. think in the cold. Gumbo. Jambalaya, red beans and rice, shrimp and grits, etouffee. These are gifts of the enslaved community. Filling and sustaining foods. They're quick, they're easy, they're relatively cheap to make. They're never limited by the ingredients. If you don't have something, you just use something else. If you don't have, well, if you don't have pork, well, you use fish, you use shrimp, you use crawfish, you use chicken. If you don't have that, well, use turkey, use alligator, mix and match, use eggplant, use something. If you don't have something, for instance, how many of y'all have tried grits? All right, how many of y'all hated it? All right, if you're not used to it, then you're definitely not going to like it. Particularly if you're not from the South. And I don't know if Florida counts as the South. It depends on where you're from. At one point, it was considered animal grade food. Fit for consumption not by humans, but by animals and members of the enslaved community. There's a number of millstones on the property here. There's those circular stones that you see dotted about in some of the gardens. There's one right behind you, just behind that palm right there. Those millstones have been here for a long time. When corn is milled, you wind up with two products, flour and grit, a fine particle. The flour becomes corn grit. That's a staple throughout the southeast. The grits becomes grits. And if you've had bad grits, it's because you had plain grits, so you're not used to the texture. They don't have a flavor. So if you put salt and butter in them, they're gonna taste like salt and butter. But if you start to treat them a little bit differently, treat them the same way you treat rice, well now you end up with something completely different. Don't just put salt and butter in it because you're not gonna like it. Put a little bit of meat, maybe some shrimp and some spice in them. Put some cheese in them. Put some vegetables and spice. Put vegetables and meat, vegetable meat and spice. Well now you got something going. You treat them the same way you treat rice. The limitation for these dishes is not the ingredients. It is only the size, the pot. That determines how many people get to eat. You don't make gumbo for four, you make it for 14. You make jambalaya for when 50 of your family and friends are coming over. They're delicious dishes that are meant to be shared with a community of people. But what else does the enslaved community do with their limited time off other than cooking and gardening? What are they actually doing on their days on? We're gonna find out. We're gonna look at three people today. Amelia field slave and mother of five, Thomas, an apprentice blacksmith and farrier, and Hyacintha house slave, cooked the big house. 
Now to find out about these three people, I've gone through the primary documents myself, but they are limited. Bills of sale, appraisals, rental agreements, baptismal records. It's a fragmented history at best, but it's about as accurate a story as I can give for these three people. Keep in mind though, that there are three out of over 220 individuals that were enslaved on this one plantation over the course of 29 years. There are tens of thousands of plantations across the U.S. over several hundred years of history. This is a unique look at life for a couple of individuals on a single southern Louisiana sugarcane plantation. But without further ado, I want to talk about these people. Let's start with Amelia. As I said, a field slave with five kids, her half of her cabin is very crowded. Herself, her children, maybe her husband's on the property, a parent or a sibling that starts to add up to seven, eight, maybe even nine people. That's a lot of people for one half of one cabin. Now, every day before the sun is up, Amelia has a lot of stuff to do. She's gotta wake up, cook breakfast, eat, leave aside food for her kids, and say goodbye to them. The moment it was light enough to see, it was light enough for Amelia to start working. She's gonna be digging and maintaining irrigation and drainage canals, maintaining the levees, taking care of the cane crop, tending to a wide assortment of activities that have to get done on the property virtually every single day. Now, Amelia's best case scenario, her shortest work week possible on this property at least, is Monday through Friday, sunrise to sunset, as well as half a day Saturday. That means that her longest possible weekend should be about half a day Saturday and the whole day Sunday. But a plantation is a fancy word for farm. Have any of y'all ever spent any time on a farm before? We farm. Oh, y'all farm. What do y'all farm? Corn, soybeans, alfalfa. I used to milk cows. All right, so y'all got plants, animals, you got a little bit of everything. All right, and your experience and your expertise, your farms take days off. No. But what if it's Sunday? Not if you want to make money and not if you want to keep those cows from being very upset because well, the funny thing about cows is they don't care if it's Sunday and they need to get milk not once but generally twice a day. I heard sometimes upwards of three times a day depending the on the season. Yeah. And if you don't, that's not good for the cows. Uh, so in reality what that means is every day you've got a book of chores because there's more than cows in the property. Cows, horses, mules, oxen, sheep, pigs, goats, chickens. Well, they all want to get fed, watered, and looked after in the morning, in the afternoon. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're dealing with plants or animals. If there are animals, well, they don't care. But at least plants have downtime, right? Wrong. Not on a sugarcane plantation. Up north they do. Up north they do because you all have this thing called winter. <laughs> this is as close to winter as we get. <coughs> uh, sugarcane is a 12-month crop. The end of one season marks the beginning of the next. There's always something to deal with. In the harvesting season, it's three months straight of 18 hours on, six hours off, 24-7, no weekends, no breaks, no holidays, late September through early January. That's not even counting roof repair, fence work, the odds and ends, ditch maintenance. In reality, well, for nine months out of the year at least, Amelia has a fourth day Saturday. She has half the day Sunday. It's always minus the booking of chores, but it's never time off because well, on a real farm, you don't have time off. It's time off on the regularly assigned set of work. It's time on for the community work. Before I get to whatever moments Amelia does have off though, I do want to talk about Thomas because he has the same schedule. Monday through Friday, sunrise, sunset, half a day Saturday, he's got his own booking of chores. He's an apprentice blacksmith and farrier. Now, as a blacksmith, he learns metal making. He learns how to make latches, hinges, nails, horseshoes. As a farrier, he learns hoof care. He's going to learn how to take those horseshoes and shoe, or to shod the horses, and take care of the mules. And there's about 50, 50 to 60 of them on this property at any point in time. That's a lot of hoof care. Typically, an enslaved craftsman received their apprenticeship when they're between 20 and 25 years old. Thomas is younger than that. Now, I know none of y'all are teenagers, but I know you probably know some. I want you to think of that teenager around a fire between 1 and 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. How long until they hurt themselves? Not long. Would you trust that teenager around a full-grown horse? <laughs> you did that measuring thing. Because what if they grew up with animals? Did you grow up with farm animals? How old were you the first time your parents trusted you around them by yourself? Remember, I mean, it's just part of living. It's just part of living. 
generally by about five, six, any parent that has a kid that grows up on a farm is comfortable letting them run around unsupervised because they know the animals. They know what to do, they know what not to do. By the time they're about 10, 12 years old, well, they're able to handle those animals no problem, sometimes even younger. Just a little while ago, I had a woman who was seven years old when she was helping her parents herd cattle. Because if you know what you're doing, you know what to do. Thomas grows up with horses and mules. He's going to be comfortable around them at a younger age. He grows up with the forges. He might not be fully confident, but he does have a healthy respect for them. He grows up with them. He knows what to do. He knows what not to do. But he's 10 years younger than the average. At 13 years old, he can be confident and comfortable all he wants. He's still a kid. He's a kid who works the same hours as adults every single day. Sunrise to sunset, that's a 15-hour day. And at the end of the day, when he gets home, he's tired, he's exhausted, but well, he's the youngest in his family. He needs to help out around the house. Amelia's been out in the fields all day, but she's still got five kids. So, let's see. Cooking, cleaning, dishes, laundry, fruit and vegetable gardens, care for the community, finding time to eat, finding time to spend with family and friends, well, that's a lot of stuff, and that doesn't even count finding time to sleep. And I just said they work from sun to sun. They left for work when they could barely see. They come home when they could barely see. Or sleep when you're dead. Exactly. <laughs> they gotta wait for the weekend for some things. To have enough daylight to fix a roof, repair clothes, work in the garden sometimes. Sometimes the farm will take the weekend away, but for convenience sake, let's look at the best case scenario. Stars lined up, a fourth day Saturday, half day Sunday. Now that's not a lot of time between the book and of chores, but that's Thomas and Amelia's time. And there's a difference. They get to take their time, do what they need to, when they need to, because as long as the community work is done by the end of the day, it's okay. Amelia does do a lot of sitting because she needs to use the daylight. Five kids wear through handmade clothes very quickly. So she's gonna spend most of her time sewing. If she sits and sews, she's gonna watch her husband nearby there's always work to get done. And the work he does is much the same as he does for the rest of the week. He's breaking land, uh, tilling earth for a new garden patch, or maybe repairing one of the ditches. But the difference, again, there's always a difference. Not only can he take his break when he wants to, he can take his break with whom he wants to, for however long. He can sit down next to his wife for a few moments. They can talk, they can watch their kids run around. They're doing their own chores, but in between the chores, they're playing. They haven't had a chance to watch them play in a long time. Thomas is a kid. He wants to spend time with his dad. He's gonna be hunting and fishing on the plantation property, catching rabbits in the back, going fishing off the front. But I don't know if he does that with his dad or not, because I don't know. In the state of Louisiana, children 10 and under can't be separated away from their mothers. That is a state law. But 11 and older, fathers, husbands, extended family, it's not the case. They can be separated. I don't know who Thomas's dad is or Amelia's husband. I mentioned earlier that the record that I have is fragmented at best of times. This is a fragment that's been lost. I don't know who they are and I don't know where they are. If they aren't on this property, there was still hope as long as the stars lined up, as long as best case scenario. Thomas might get to go fishing with his dad every other Sunday morning. Once or twice a month, Amelia's husband might be allowed to come to this property. Maybe he share a meal with his wife and kids. Maybe once a month for good behavior. He didn't get into any mischief. He didn't make any mistakes. Once a month he gets a special permission note from his owners to spend the night with his own family. Punishment wasn't earned back then. It was given. It was given for mistakes. It was given for accidents. It was given because other people made mistakes. If a slave made a mistake, it was the slave's fault. But if the owner made the mistake, it was still the slave's fault. The sky opened up, a deluge came down, 100 year storm, there's nothing anybody could have done to prevent the torrential flooding, but ditches overflowed, crops flooded, profits lost. It was still the slave's fault because they should have dug better ditches. Physical punishment was what it was, but mental wounds cut deeper, they last for longer. It's fear that a small mistake that somebody else made might have meant the difference between seeing family that week, that month, or a couple of months. This is Thomas and Amelia, so a craftsman and a field slave Let's quickly look at Hyacinth. I see y'all looking at your watches, your buses. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Don't worry, no, I've only got about two or three more minutes. Yeah, sure. There we go. Let's look and see what Hyacinth's day was really like on this property. So he's cooked the big house. Y'all have breakfast? Yes, 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 very good. Don't skip lunch. 
Y'all are bound by the road. Y'all are bound by the bus schedule. Don't make it a late lunch. Late lunches become early dinners, become combined meals. I recommend either for lunch or dinner tonight, especially if y'all are a little chilly, have gumbo. A cup of gumbo, a bowl of gumbo. Some people do soup weather, some people do stew weather. We do gumbo weather. It's going to fill you up. It's going to warm you right down to the bone. Weekends, weekdays, family meals, holiday meals, before the sun is up, after the sun is set, and every time in between, we're people we all like to eat. And every single one of y'all has been up past your bedtimes eating and drinking with family and friends because that's what we do. We're people. We're social. We like to talk. We like to eat. We really like to combine the two worlds. But Jacques and Selena Roman, master and mistress of the plantation, they're also people, and they're also social, and they also like to eat. Hyacinth works Monday through Monday through Monday from before the house is up until after the house is going to bed. His best case scenario then is five to seven hours of uninterrupted sleep in his own bed with a half hour of personal time on either end. Now, he's a gentleman. If he's a father or a husband, I have no idea. But I can say without a doubt that if he does have family on this property, he can't take care of them. When he leaves to cook for the house in the morning, his family's still asleep. When he comes home at the end of the day, his family's already asleep. He sees them when he sees them. He has to let other people take care of his family for him. Breakfast, mid-morning, lunch, dinner. Four meals.